Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Enrichment of CFF DNA and CT DNA via size selection for reduced diagnostic assay costs, presented by Dr. Matthew Nesbitt, President of Coastal Genomics. I'm Cece Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We're excited to bring you this educational virtual conference presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Here's how the presentation will work today. We want to hear from you. Questions, comments, and even answers can be submitted via the Q&A button at the lower left of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone, but if not, we'll make sure to follow up with you by email. You can also enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon on the lower right-hand corner of your slide window. If you cannot hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or the Q&A button at the lower left. This is an educational webinar and offers free continuing educational credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located at the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process for obtaining your credit. Without further ado, I'd like to present and introduce today's speaker, Dr. Matthew Nesbitt. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Susie. And uh, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me uh, talk today about the uh, opportunities that uh, are being explored out there, uh, as well as uh, new methods for the enrichment of cell-free fetal day DNA and circulating tumor DNA. Uh, without further ado, I will launch into the presentation. So a little bit on cell-free DNA and what it is. Uh, cell-free DNA is a DNA that is sourced from cells that are inside the body uh, that have died and are being recycled. Uh, the, the DNA is broken down uh, and it ends up in the circulatory system. Uh, so that means that the cell-free DNA stems from all sorts of tissues uh, in the body. Uh, obviously, this means things such as normal tissues, uh, shed cells that uh, contribute to the cell-free DNA or CFDNA pool, uh, as do any uh, possible tumors that actually uh, reside in an individual. And uh, in the case of a pregnant mother, uh, a fetus too will shed DNA uh, and, that, and will contribute to that cell-free DNA pool. Um, this means that uh, through a blood draw, uh, one could potentially sequence DNA from all these tissue types, uh, and that would allow the, uh, the, the doctor or anyone else who is actually conducting any research to uh, find things such as the presence of a tumor uh, or learn about what the genetic characteristics are of the fetus. Uh, without necessitating uh, an invasive procedure, which has been a, a standard to date for uh, such work. Now, cell-free DNA work is new. Uh, it has been something that is coming along uh, for the uh, utility with fetal diagnostics. And uh, as far as being used as a diagnostic for tumors, uh, it is something that is still in development. And uh, one of the uh, issues with the uh, utilization of cell-free DNA for diagnostics is that uh, we really suffer from the needle in the haystack problem. Um, and what we mean by that is that cell-free DNA fragments that originate from a fetus or a tumor uh, are really greatly outnumbered by all those cell-free DNA fragments that originate from normal tissue. Uh, this means that uh, in any liquid biopsy, you would have to query a large number of normal, uninteresting cell-free DNA fragments for every single fragment you get from a tissue that you're interested in characterizing. Um, furthermore, uh, you know, the one way to actually to deal with that is to try to get rid of cell-free DNA fragments that originate from normal tissues. But there are situations in which uh, such a process can lead to the erroneous discarding of fragments from a fetus or a tumor. Uh, in, in situations where there are not very many of these types of fragments, 
the result could be a, a false negative result. Uh, and in such a situation, a recovery of all available so-called needles would be critical in order to be able to determine the presence of, a, uh, of an early stage tumor, for example, or to be able to render a diagnostic on an aneuploidy uh, associated with a fetus. So cell-free DNA testing obviously can either be costly or uh, lack diagnostic sensitivity. Um, cell-free uh, fetal DNA testing right now is a costly procedure compared to uh, standards of care. And uh, we are seeing an actual increase even with this uh, huge uh, uh, relative cost uh, of this test. Um, in uh, 2016, out of 210 million insurance policy covering U.S. lives, 90 million of those uh, included coverage for uh, cell-free DNA testing associated with average risk pregnancies. Now, that represents a 60% growth over that year. Uh, but it can still be quite costly compared to standard care options and, and based on amniocentesis or chorionic villi sampling. And there are, there's a real need to actually drop the cost of this test in order to make it accessible to all. And the way that uh, right now these costs are minimized is to actually uh, take advantage of a so-called large-scale economy of scale sequencing. Uh, so what we mean by this is instead of every hospital being able to conduct a sequencing on uh, all the pregnant mothers in the maternity ward, uh, these samples are normally uh, shipped to major hubs in the world that uh, end up being able to benefit from the uh, lowered cost per base pair uh, associated with high throughput sequencing. Uh, the problem then becomes that uh, shipping becomes a, a hurdle uh, to uh, dropping the cost. Uh, when you have uh, patients that are having uh, blood samples sent from all over the world to either the San Francisco Bay Area or Hong Kong, then uh, that FedEx cost becomes a, a barrier to, being a, uh, to this being a test that is actually at a price point that makes it accessible to everybody. So that is a little bit of a discussion on the issue of cost and what the reality is of it. And of course, as I also mentioned, there is the issue of uh, sensitivity and, and uh, as, as well as how do we actually get rid of all of the fragments that stem from normal tissues that uh, end up driving up the cost of these assays. So there are a number of uh, technologies that exist on the market today that try to answer this question. I'm just going to go over a couple of them right here. Um, the first one that I'd like to talk about is the on-target platform. Uh, this is a solution provided by Boreal Genomics, uh, which is a, a proprietary system uh, that exposes a cell-free DNA sample uh, to an agarose gel. Uh, and the agarose gel it has a, a lawn of affixed probes that are complementary uh, to mutations that are desired to be uh, isolated from the normal cell-free DNA fragments. Uh, the on-target platform uses a process known as SCOTA, and the continual binding events between target molecules and the affixed probes ends up leading to a discrepancy uh, in the uh, direction of travel uh, generated by the electrophoretic uh, SCOTA uh, assay. And this ends up leading to a, a number of binding events and uh, basically a means of actually separating normal fragments from tumor fragments. Uh, the, uh, the process is very efficient. Uh, it can enrich known mutant alleles over a million fold from what they would otherwise have been at uh, without any processing. And the yield uh, is also uh, uh, relatively high and typically being over 50%. And so this is a fantastic way to uh, be able to enrich mutants that were known uh, and sought out before the actual experiment started. Uh, the drawback here is just the fact that you do have to know what that mutation is in order to be able to appropriately design the probes that are affixed to the gel long. And of course, uh, in certain situations, uh, you know, a, there will be no preconceived notion as to what uh, the type of tumor is that you're looking for. And thus, uh, you know, this might be a little bit narrow in scope. Uh, 
for some applications. So backing out and broadening the scope a little bit, there are other solutions that uh, take a less specific approach. Uh, the the CAPSEQ system, uh, which was uh, which comes from the uh, Stanford laboratories of Max Dean and Ash Alizade, uh, this this is an option that was actually uh, acquired by Roche and uh, has been uh, marketed as the Avenio kit. And it's a, uh, based on a, a target capture and a, uh, combined with a bioinformatics method to, uh, to generate a highly specific, highly sensitive test for cell-free tumor DNA. Uh, the method basically takes advantage uh, of uh, a selector probe set, which is used as a uh, bait for uh, different genetic elements that are desired to be isolated from uh, the rest of the DNA uh, associated with the cell-free sample. But this approach is a little bit different uh, than that taken uh, by the on-target platform. Uh, what's going on here is that there are uh, certain genetic recurrent mutations associated with genes or other elements that are uh, understood and characterized through population-wide screening. And the actual test as it is applied to an individual will use a selector probe set that was found to be ideal for pulling out uh, genetic elements associated with current mutations and isolating them from everything else. So what this means is that you're getting uh, specific uh, genes, maybe, uh, maybe perhaps uh, the P53 gene, and you're getting all of the mutated as well as the normal versions of it. So there is still a uh, increased cost because you're sequencing through normal DNA, but the isolation event does greatly uh, drop the cost of the assay. And uh, the reported sensitivity of these assays by the uh, authors uh, has gone all the way down to 0.02%. Uh, however, the, uh, the Avenio kit itself uh, is not uh, reporting such sensitivity. Um, I believe that that is actually more along the line of 0.4%, and that's a result of the fact that to achieve the 0.02% sensitivity, uh, a very costly sequencing operation is required. Uh, but then again, the, uh, the benefit of this is that instead of looking for a specific point mutation in the P53 gene, uh, the CAPSEQ approach can take the entire P53 gene, uh, which can then be sequenced and look for mutations which could uh, influence the uh, progression of a tumor. So there are also uh, continue to be new discoveries about uh, what the characteristics are associated with cell-free DNA, uh, both when uh, groups are looking into uh, utilizing it for fetal diagnostics as well as tumor diagnostics. Uh, this uh, slide here goes over a uh, finding by the Dennis Lowe group here. Uh, where it was uh, realized that there's actually a size discrepancy between cell-free DNA fragments that stem from the fetus and those that stem uh, from the mother. Uh, as you can see in the uh, graph on the right-hand side here, the blue line actually represents the fragment length distribution profile for the fetal component of the cell-free DNA profile whereas the red line shows the average between both the maternal and the fetal uh, contributions. Uh, there's an average difference between these two of roughly 22 base pairs. Uh, and of course, this actually opens the door to a different method of enrichment, namely gel-based size selection. Uh, this would require a very tight size selection in order to be able to recover as much of the fetal component while rejecting as much of the maternal component. Um, however, if you could do this, there appears that there would be room for relative enrichment of CFF DNA uh, over, the, uh, normal C, uh, over the normal material in the cell-free DNA component. Other findings also appear to suggest a size-specific bias for fragments uh, that originate from tumors. Uh, a group at the University of Utah uh, led by Dr. Hunter Underhill actually set out to characterize um, such uh, potential for enrichment via very tight size selection 
enabled by polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Uh, as you can see in the uh, graphic on the right here, uh, Dr. Underhill ended up fractionating uh, a cell-free profile into numerous different size ranges and then went about uh, a digital PCR experiment that was meant to characterize the relative ratio of uh, mutant allele frequencies, uh, so to speak, associated with the unsized selected portion as well as all the different fractions in the size selection uh, itself. Um, as we can see here in the C diagram on the far left, uh, this digital PCR experiment found that without size selection, the mutant allele frequency registered at about one-third of one percent. Uh, the other uh, mutant allele frequency graphs uh, to the right of this one on the left here show that uh, we actually have variable uh, mutant allele frequencies, uh, some that are lower than the on size like ones, but some that are actually quite higher too. Um, actually as high as uh, tenfold uh, in terms of an enrichment over the unsized selected fraction. What we can do is we can see with this graph representing the actual unsized selected portion here, we find that there was a size selection as well uh, that uh, allowed for an enrichment of the mutant allele frequency all the way up to 3%. So it seems like size selection uh, on a very, very uh, tight basis can potentially be used to increase the level of uh, these mutant alleles over the allele over uh, cell-free DNA fragments that stem from normal tissues. So to consider gel size selection as an option for this requires us to think a little bit about exactly what the implications are. So the reasons to consider it are that it can potentially increase uh, the ratio of mutant fragments or fetal fragments uh, over the normal fragments that come to dominate the cell-free uh, sample, cell-free DNA sample. Uh, this, of course, can decrease the sequencing costs because we do not have to sequence as many normal cell-free DNA fragments um, before we get to those fragments that stem from a fetus or from a tumor. The other potential benefit is that it is sequence independent being that uh, because it is just a, uh, the size selection is based on the fragment length, there is no requirement to understand what the mutation was beforehand in order to develop a bait approach uh, uh, in order to recover fragments associated with tumors or with uh, fetuses. However, there are drawbacks to this as well. The size selection that is required uh, and that was used by the group at the uh, University of Utah is tedious. Um, the University of Utah has actually reported that it took two full days to actually conduct the polyacrylamide uh, gel size selection, which enables highly accurate, very tight size selection. Uh, this, of course, would not translate well to a clinical environment where numerous samples are being processed uh, every day. Uh, the other drawback of this is that it is possible that through a uh, size selection like this that not all fragments of interest land in the region of interest and that we would be discarding them. And in such a situation, if we had very few fragments of interest to begin with, we could end up uh, discarding fragments that matter and then uh, generating false negative results. So to think a little bit about that last point, about uh, where does it really hurt us if we're just doing a, uh, a size selection uh, on a uh, sample of cell-free DNA. Uh, this graph here shows a little bit of the uh, relationship uh, between the disease state or gestational phase along with the uh, relative amount of uh, cell-free fetal DNA or circulating tumor DNA. Uh, obviously, when we're taking a look at um, early detection uh, of tumors or, or you know, prior to the end of the first trimester of a pregnancy, we have very, very few uh, fragments uh, relative to normal cell-free DNA fragments uh, in any blood draw or any other liquid biopsy. However, uh, when we look at uh, later disease states uh, or as the fetus ages, 
uh, the amount of uh, cell free DNA that's contributed by uh, either a tumor or a fetus is increased with respect to normal cell free DNA. Uh, so again, so here at the early stage, uh, it's very likely that there's, uh, there's too few mutant allele, allele frequency uh, for size selection to be something that uh, would be really considered as a, as a viable option here, simply because we may be throwing out everything uh, with such a general uh, size selection. However, when you take a look at some of the other um, applications, uh, as in you know, uh, cell-free fetal DNA testing uh, towards the end of the first trimester, uh, or a treatment selection, or possibly surveillance uh, of a disease state, there are a relatively higher number of uh, fragments that are non-normal in origin. And this increases the chance of us being able to use size selection to drop the cost of the assay while not reducing the sensitivity to a point that makes the, uh, the whole effort um, worthless. So now I'm going to introduce to you uh, Coastal Genomics Ranger technology. Uh, this is an automated option that is uh, leading in its class for highly accurate, repeatable gel-based size selection. Uh, Ranger technology it comes in two permutations right now. Uh, the first is the Nimbus Select. This is a fully automated liquid handling workstation. It comes equipped with Ranger Technologies hardware platform as well as its uh, machine vision software uh, outfit. Uh, the light bench is due to be released later this year and it will be featuring Ranger technology on a scaled down basis uh, in a modular uh, box which can be integrated with liquid handling robots or it can also be leveraged by bench technicians. So I'm going to be moving into the next few slides here to talk a little bit about what Ranger technology is and what can be accomplished with it. This slide right here shows the deck layout of the Nimbus Select. As we can see here at the front and rear of the instrument, uh, we have what are known as electrophoresis pedestals. So the first one is outlined in yellow here, and the second one is in the back right here. Um, the middle here hosts a DNA source plate which is used to house the DNA sample as well as a loading buffer with a proprietary uh, marker mixture uh, in, sourced with it. Uh, the, this mixture of samples is loaded into the gel cassettes which are loaded onto the electrophoresis pedestals automatically by the liquid handler. Uh, when the size selection event is complete, size selected fractions are reformatted to a second target plate here which is then ready for downstream processing. So this represents the first part of the hardware component of Ranger technology being the two electrophoresis pedestals. The second co hardware component of Ranger technology involves some mounted components that on the gantry of the robot, specifically a camera that is used for capturing images of the gel cassettes and the DNA as it's being electrophoresed. A illumination stage is also attached uh, in order to cause dye molecules that are in the loading buffer and bound to DNA to fluoresce. Uh, this fluorescence is the signal that is captured by the camera. And you will also note that the lighting array uses two different colors right now, a uh, blue light and a red light. The blue light is used to excite cybergold, which binds globally to all DNA in the sample. Uh, the red light, meanwhile, is used to excite a secondary dye molecule, which is exclusively attached to a two-marker system that is loaded with every sample. This marker system is critical for the uh, uh, real-time assessment of electrophoretic mobility uh, that is going to be conducted in every single channel. And this allows us to actually realize uh, and take, it, uh, take control of any differences between samples that may uh, alter the mobility of DNA through an electrophoretic laneway. Such variables include temperature, ionic strength, and pH.
This animation here will highlight for you exactly how the Nimbus Select conducts its work with Ranger technology. So at the outset, uh, we assume that we have a source plate with a DNA sample and our loading buffer with the marker mixture all together in a source plate. Uh, the liquid handling manifold then comes down and aspirates this mixture out of the source plate. The liquid handling manifold then moves over to one of the standard Agaros cassettes, which is a very simple in design. Uh, the cassette is comprised of liquid buffer reservoirs at the distal ends of the cassette. And in the middle, we have an Agaros block uh, with uh, 12 physically isolated channels uh, running down the length of the actual cassette. Also, the, uh, there are preformed loading and extraction wells associated with every of these 12 channels here. And we'll see how the liquid handler interfaces with those shortly here. Manifold deposits the mixture of DNA sample and the loading buffer into the loading wells. And at this point, the electrophoresis is initiated. And what is going to happen now is that the camera that's mounted to the gantry is going to take pictures of the entire cassette roughly once every couple of minutes. And we're going to be taking pictures with the red light turned on in order to be able to visualize our marker system. And you'll see that there's two markers in every channel. Then we're going to be taking pictures with the blue light turned on in order to be able to see the actual DNA sample itself. So, once every couple of minutes, the picture is captured and the software measures the mobility of the DNA sample in every channel and also identifies where the target is in every channel because the target is not necessarily the same in every channel. And, uh, and by doing this, it can understand exactly what the relative mobility is of every sample in this cassette and alter the voltage to manipulate that mobility in a way that allows for the synchronous arrival of target fractions at a downstream extraction well. Once that has taken place, the manifold comes down, aspirates out the sample, and deposits it into a target or destination plate for further processing. So what's really happened here is that there has been an ongoing real-time assessment of mobility of DNA samples for each of 12 samples. Um, this allows for highly accurate, repeatable size selection. A little bit now on how this is actually, what this actually results in. The precision of the uh, Ranger technology size selection, again, is based on real-time tracking of mobility changes of every sample uh, on, you know, so, so that uh, the exact target that is desired can be recovered every time. Uh, this secures the collection of desired fraction at the point of extraction because we're able to manipulate the exact point or the exact uh, voltage that's applied to every sample and we can drive it exact to the exact point in the well that we want it to for extraction. This uh, as we can see here on the bottom, uh, led to a very consistent size selection over a number of samples uh, that, that, as characterized by a fragment analyzer readout of, a, uh, of some samples that had gone through size selection with Ranger technology. Um, there are other options for size selection as well that are viable options. Uh, however, most of them are based on line scanning technologies, which basically measure the mobility of DNA at a single coordinate in a cassette. What this means, though, is that should that mobility change at a point past the uh, first assessment of mobility, then there will be a slight deviation uh, between what the desired recovered fraction was and what the actual uh, recovered fraction ends up becoming. And this can lead to a slight variation uh, between samples as to what's recovered. Due to the very discrete nature and high resolution and accuracy that was required by the University of Utah in order to obtain their tenfold enrichment of mutant allele frequencies, um, such a deviation uh, would not result in a repeatable method 
for enriching uh, for these mutant allele uh, fragments. Ranger technology also brings the benefit of very high accuracy. Um, because we are conducting an analysis on the full channel, we can take advantage of two markers simultaneously to interpolate between them to actually come up with a very accurate estimate on what the size of the target can be between them. The accuracy specification associated with Ranger technology is 5%. However, very often the, uh, the error that's associated with it is much lower than this. And furthermore, because the system uses long electrophoretic laneways, uh, we are able to achieve a very impressive resolution that is on par with polyacrylamide gel size selection. Um, as can be seen on the right here, uh, Fragments that differ by only 10 base pairs can be isolated from each other and therefore extracted from each other uh, by the time they arrive at the extraction well. Um, this sort of resolution is right on par with what was used in the polyacrylamide gel size selection by the University of Utah. Uh, and it also affords uh, very impressive intrinsic recovery yields, typically uh, above 80% of the material that is found within the target range. So again, to talk about the utility of gel size selection as it can be applied to cell-free fetal DNA or circulating tumor DNA, we have to consider a number of realities associated with this new field that is exciting and promises uh, to play a part in all of our lives as we, uh, as we age and as we go through life. Uh, the first is that gel size selection does have the potential to drop sequencing costs via size selection enrichment that uh, brings up the relative level of cell repeal DNA or circulating tumor DNA. Uh, however, it should be noted that this is likely not a good option for all applications. Uh, it would only be applicable to samples with non-negligible levels of mutant allele frequencies. Um, Cell-free fetal DNA testing is typically done uh, at the end of the first trimester uh, at a point where that, uh, where that ratio is at about the 10% level. And this is sufficient uh, to be able to go through a tight size selection for the purpose of dropping the cost of the assay while ensuring that there is still a reasonable amount of that material in order to conduct a diagnostic assay. Other applications associated with uh, circuit and tumor DNA testing are yet to be decided upon. Uh, certainly early stage uh, tumor testing uh, may or may not be something that is viable given the low mutant allele frequency load. However, th uh, certain disease states, and perhaps when uh, the patient is at a spot where treatment selection is necessary, uh, these, these sorts of applications where there is increased uh, mutant allele frequency load uh, may uh, allow themselves to have the assay cost drop via gel size selection. Furthermore, by utilizing gel size selection for cell-free fetal DNA testing, we are opening the door, potentially, to groups not having to ship samples from all over the world to hubs in San Francisco or Hong Kong or wherever they may be. Um, this is really being enabled by the fact that uh, through a reduced sequencing cost, um, that per base pair cost associated with the smaller benchtop sequencers that are out there now become competitive. Um, and by doing so, that absolves the need for costly shipping around the world of these samples. So to uh, summarize here, ranger technology can be used to repeatedly isolate tight DNA fraction ranges. And it does come in two different formats. The Nimbus Select can run up to 96 size selections per run. Uh, while the light bench right now can run up to eight samples per run, but can integrate with any Hamilton liquid handling robot to automate the process of assay plate setup or cassette unloading or loading. Um, it, is also a, it also has the flexibility of being able to work with a bench technician as well, should that be the route someone wants to take. And with that, I would like to thank everybody for your time and uh, for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Nesbitt.
for that informative presentation. And we do want to begin now with our Q&A segment. So here's a reminder to audience members how you can communicate with us. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button at the lower left of your screen. If we are unable to get to your questions due to time constraints, Dr. Nesbitt has volunteered to answer any submitted questions via email. So let's take a look at our first question of the day. Dr. Nesbitt, an audience member would like to know, did the University of Utah find that the fragment length over which there was significant enrichment stay the same for different tumor types? Thank you very much for the question. Um, the findings in the uh, paper that uh, was published in June of last year uh, were from a small sample set uh, where there's uh, only uh, glioblastoma and lung cancer samples were looked at uh, on a small basis. Um, the findings right now are inconclusive on whether the size range is the same uh, throughout different cancer types or even if there's a difference in uh, the progression or stage of a, of a tumor. Follow-up work is being uh, conducted and hopefully answers to these questions will be coming uh, you know, in the near future. Thank you for that answer. And here's another question. Can bead-based uh, bead approaches be used to enrich for CFF DNA or CT DNA? Thank you. Uh, bead-based approaches are a viable uh, means of size selection for a number of sequencing applications. Uh, and when they can be leveraged, they should because they are highly amenable to automation. Uh, right now, uh, as far as their application for enrichment of cell-free fetal DNA or circulating tumor DNA samples, uh, the early uh, thinking is that the the ability to uh, effectively discriminate over a tight range using beads uh, is not something that is compatible with what the requirements would be for uh, an enrichment using a size selection. Um, gel size selection has the advantage of being able to get a good yield out of a size selection that, uh, requ that is required to be extremely narrow in terms of size. Uh, and if you'll recall from the slide that uh, highlighted the work at the University of Utah, um, in order to actually tease out the different fractions and find that one that uh, had an enrichment on the order of tenfold, they required a polyacrylamide gel size selection where the, uh, the size range that you're getting is on the, uh, on, the, on the range of a plus or minus 10 base pairs. Um, such a tight range uh, should that be sought with the bead-based size selection uh, would most likely yield in next to 0% recovery. Uh, beads are more effective at uh, other applications uh, such as Nextera library preparation or PCR-free library preparation. Um, as of today, it appears that size selection for enrichment on these uh, cell-free or these circulating tumor DNA samples will require the stringency, uh, so the stringency afforded by a type gel-based size selection. Thank you again, Dr. Nesbitt, and thank you for the important research that you're doing. Do you have any closing remarks you'd like to share with the audience before we leave today? Yeah, sure. Just to, uh, just to sum up here, um, obviously uh, cell-free fetal DNA testing for, uh, serves as a uh, real uh, boon in terms of being able to be used as a non-invasive prenatal diagnostic tool. And we've seen a growing adoption of this tool uh, because it affords uh, pregnant mothers uh, a lot of comfort and uh, the uh, positive predictive value of the test uh, seems to be one that is uh, being very valuable in terms of putting a lot of people at ease. Um, 
on the front of circulating tumor DNA, there are groups that are doing uh, testing with this uh, right now. Um, obviously, you know, the future is, uh, we are told, is going to uh, uh, include a reality where uh, individuals have their uh, blood tested every other year uh, in order to be able to detect uh, the presence of early stage tumors. Um, if such a reality were to ever come, then it would be interesting indeed because uh, to be able, the ability to identify tumors at stage one or stage two presence um, decades uh, potentially uh, before they otherwise would have been detected should allow the medical community to be able to uh, act quickly and, and help to uh, drop the cost of health care that um, is associated with later stage tumor treatment. Thank you again, Dr. Matthew Nesbitt. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2017. Keep an eye out for an email from LabRoots sharing you when this webcast will be available for replay. We encourage you to forward this announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you again next time. Goodbye.